My name is Dr. Kevin Langford. I am the director of the pre-health professions programs. I'm also an associate professor in the biology department. So many of your students are gonna have just a few classes with me over the next couple of years. But what we're here to talk about today are all of those things that are gonna help you be successful getting into your chosen professional school. So this morning, you want to know what it means to be a pre-health profession student, and you want to know what it is you need to do to be successful in your chosen career. That's all part of what we're going to help you accomplish over the next couple of years. So what, what does it mean? It's a lot of things to a lot of different people. And as you go through your next four years of undergraduate college, you're actually going to be accomplishing two things. The first is you are going to be earning a degree. Now let me dispel a myth that is rampant around college campuses. There is no such thing as a pre-med major. Maybe you have heard that, I hope you have. But medical schools, dental schools, pharmacy schools could care less what your degree is in. There's some things that they're going to expect and the first is gonna be good grades and we'll talk about that in a bit. But they don't care what your degree is in. In fact, for the past couple of years, about 45% of those students that got accepted into medical schools were not science majors. That might come as a surprise to many of you. Now, all students are going to take plenty of sciences. But what I want you to think about, rather than your major, I want you to answer this question in your mind. It's not an easy one. If I couldn't be a doctor or a dentist or a pharmacist, what is my backup career plan outside the health professions. When you can answer that question, I can help you find the major that will fit that. Now that's terribly important because you're gonna hear me say this a number of times. For every seat in a medical school class, there are four people that wanna sit in it, you being one of those four. So it's highly competitive. And many people that start out to be a pre-health profession student, a pre-med, don't make it into medical school. So your backup career plan could very easily become your plan A career plan over a very couple of years. But I also want you to look at it as career insurance. Now parents in here, everyone has car insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Do you ever plan to use your car insurance? Mm -hmm. Do you ever wonder why you're paying so much money on something you never plan to use? Every six months. Every six <laughs> unfortunately. But that is what your major is. It is that career insurance that you never plan to use. Now, we have car insurance, well, because the state tells us to, but we also have it just in case. If someone were to tell you to major in, I don't know, give me an academic major, just something off the top of your head. Cultural studies. Cultural studies. Somebody told you you had to major in multicultural studies to go to medical school, there are a lot of us that go, mm, I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in history or English or music. So if you had to take those classes, your grades wouldn't be very good because you're not enjoying them. If you did make good grades, it would be a lot more work. So then you're going to end up with a degree that you are never going to use because you're never going to get into medical school, but you're going to have a job instead of a career. So. First thing you're gonna think about, what is my backup career and what major will go with that? Now on a college campus, including SFA, that can be any academic area, except for nursing, that's the only one. Nursing courses go in that direction and medical classes go in that direction. But all other majors will work together with your prerequisite sciences and my job is to help blend the two. So your, your degree work and your science and math prerequisites. Here's the good news. You're in college now. College is a lot of fun. College is going to be the most fun you're ever going to have in your entire life. Because after college, things creep into your life that I just categorize as fun suckers. <laughs> Mortgages, car and life insurance, and the biggest fun sucker of all, children. <laughs> They're money suckers too, but fun suckers. So you're gonna enjoy college, but you know what, as a pre-health profession student, 
you're going to work really hard. You have a lot of studying you have to do. Many of you are also getting involved in research, which will, will be a plus for your application. Now, on a college campus, you're going to hear a lot of different messages. And the messages I want you to hear and flush from your mind is that message that a lot of students walk around saying, hey, D for degree. <laughs> you can always retake a class, but you can never make up a party. <laughs> no. No, we're not hearing those messages. Those people just need a degree, and they can get it by the skin of their teeth and get a great job. Not you. And so when I look at my pre-health profession students versus the regular college student, this is what I see. These are the regular college students. Do you know who you are? Yeah. You're these guys. Have you, we know who these are, right? Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs. Have you seen what they put these people through, especially in that last hell week of their training? They don't get to sleep. They don't get to eat. They keep them out in the freezing cold water. Basically torture these people. And all they have to do is walk up the beach, ring a little bell, and they can go in where it's warm, get something to eat, hot cup of coffee, and a bed to sleep in. That's all they got to do. Why do these people subject them to a week's worth of torture? Why do they do it? Want to be elite? Want to be elite? They want to be a Navy SEAL more than anything else in their life. Certainly more than that temporary discomfort. There are going to be a lot of times, students, you're not going to want to study. There are going to be a lot of times you don't want to do a lot of the other things you have to do. But if you want to be a doctor more than anything else, you're going to get the job done. And you have to answer that question for yourself. All right. So we're going to talk about the five full-time jobs you now have. Are you tired yet? Has anyone ever had a full-time job? How about five at the same time? The first, <laughs> yeah, some parents are laughing at that one. The first full-time job you as a pre-health profession student have, and there's no surprise, is you must make excellent grades. Now, on a college campus, when you look at grades, straight A's is a 4.0. I know some high schools, you'll hear valedictorians graduating with a 4.6 and a 5. Point. No, 4.0 is it at the top. And so when you look at the competitive nature of medical school, four people want one seat. So they can take the best of the best. It's not enough to be good enough. You've got to be better than the other three. And so when you apply to medical school, the average of those that are getting accepted is what? 3.75. The average of those that applies is above a 3.5. You must have excellent grades. If you don't, you will not get into your professional school. So how do you make good grades? You study. And you study. And you study. Why do you do that? Because those three other people that want you, your seat are. You have to work hard. You're going to study a whole lot harder than the regular college student. But if you want to be that Navy SEAL, that doctor, that's what you have to do. So grades, number one. You won't hear me say a lot about grades after this. It's expected. And in fact, in our program, if your GPA falls below a 3.0, which is still well below the 3.5, but if you fall below a 3.0, we will not advise you in our office, which forces you to go to your major advisor and get advised by them because what has your career plan B just become? Plan career plan A. Excellent grades, number one first thing you must do. Now, many of you in here also have an admissions test looming in your future. For medical students, this beast is called the MCAT exam, the Medical College Admissions Test. Now, this is largely the place where I describe what a beast of a test this is, how it takes about eight hours to take the test, and how when you're finished after that full day of testing, you sort of crawl away because you can't walk. 
Guess what happened last Friday? Matt took the MCAT exam. He just got out of the hospital yesterday, so. <laughs> no, so I, I, honestly, I haven't seen Matt since last week, so I was afraid you were in the hospital, Matt. But I, I just asked him this morning, I said, how was the MCAT? And Matt just goes, Whew. So, but how do you prepare for the MCAT? Most of you took the ACT, SAT, didn't prepare at all. You, however, are going to start preparing for the MCAT. Dental students, you have the DAT. Pharmacy students, you have the PCAT. Optometry students, you have the OAT. You're going to start preparing for these tests right now. And what you're going to do is you're going to go out and you're going to buy review books that are topical. So when you're taking your general biology this fall or your general chemistry, you're going to use these review books, number one, to help you study for your test and get better grades in your class. But by starting now, you're going to become familiar with the format of the MCAT questions. So when you take the MCAT, you ready for this? In three years, you will be prepared to make a good grade. Notice I didn't say four. You take your MCAT between your junior and senior year. So you've only got three years to get ready for this beast, the MCAT. So grades, test prep, those are your two full-time jobs. Here's another full-time job. And it really is addressed from a question you're all going to have in your interview. And this question in your interview is, I want to be a doctor because I want to blank. So we're going to play Family Feud. And I want to know, we surveyed 100 students that were interviewed. We asked them this question, what is the number one answer? I want to be a doctor because I want to... Oh, my word. There's always one in every crowd, right? There's always one in every crowd. You're expecting us. We, we may, we, yeah, we hope to make money, but in the interview, we're not going to say make money. <laughs> and hopefully the truth is we want to save lives, help people. We want to help people. That is the number one answer that is given in an interview. We want to help people. And so your third full-time job is to accumulate a track record of service, helping others. That's going to start right now. What you did in high school is not going to be on your application in three years. What you've done, your service activities since college started, is what you're going to turn in. This is where our student organizations come into play. It is a great way to get plugged in and do service projects like Macy mentioned, the Habitat for Humanity, Relay for Life, a number of things going out to elementary schools. All of our organizations do that. You can do it on your own as well. But listen carefully. If you have a perfect 4.0 GPA, if you have a per perfect score on the admissions test, but you have no service on your application, you won't even get an interview. They want people that have a desire to help people. And you're going to demonstrate that by your actions. And listen, if you don't like helping people, we need to talk about your career plan. <laughs> I got my degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and people say, well, why didn't you become a real doctor? Which, I love that question, by the way. <laughs> but it was easy for me. I didn't want to be around sick, complaining people all the time. They're not happy when they come to see you. When they're happy and healthy, they don't come see you. So... You need to have a heart for service and helping others. Now, your next full-time job after grades, test prep, and service is kind of along these lines. If I am the interviewer and, and I were to say, um, ma'am, what's your name? Alexa. Alexa, Alexa uh, you want to be a doctor because you like helping people. Helping, helping people, great answer. Um, you know, Policemen, most policemen help people. Firemen helps people. My garbage man, my garbage, I love my garbage man. I don't have to go to the dump. So just because you like helping people, why do you want to be a doctor? And so your fourth full-time job, we call shadowing or gaining professional experience. What do you really know about being a doctor? And so in this case, when you get asked that question, you can say, well, when I was five years old, 
I was playing on the playground. I fell off the monkey bars and I broke my arm and went to the doctor and he put a cast on my arm. It was a G.I. Joe cast. It was really cool, camouflage. And he was so nice and it was so much fun. I've always wanted to be a doctor since I was five. I'm going to be a doctor. Or you can be that student that says, as an undergraduate student at Stephen F. Austin, I shadowed a general practice doc for 80 hours. I then shadowed a general surgeon for 40. And I was with an oncologist for 40 hours. And even though their fields were different, I saw how each one of them used their knowledge of the human body to help people have a better quality of life. And I think that's how I can best serve others. Who are you going to give the seat to in the class? G.I. Joe boy or this one? He needs, he needs help. He needs help. Gain the professional experience. Look, if you have excellent grades, if you have a perfect grade, if you have a perfect MCAT, but you have no shadowing, guess what? No interview for you. None. So you're going to pick this up. And we help facilitate through our office as early as your second semester of your freshman year. We're not going to do that with you your first semester because what are you doing that first semester? Making good grades. After you see how much time that's going to take, then we can start adding a lot more to that schedule. But good grades will be first. The fifth part of your application, are you tired yet? The fifth part is gaining leadership skills, refining them, and demonstrating your ability to be a leader. Now, leadership in our country, a lot of people think it means different things. I have twin boys. I have to break up fights all the time because one doesn't want to do what the other one wants to do. And in our country, I think we have a lot of these folks in our society these days. What, what would you call this one? The dictator? What, what's, a, what's, another, what's another word that we could apply to this one? Chief? Have you ever heard the word boss? You know, boss is a four-letter word. And fellas, if you don't know boss is not a good word, call your girlfriend or your wife bossy and you will find out in a hurry. That is not a compliment. <laughs> no, this is not what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. A leader does it first, a leader does it best, and a leader's out front saying what? Follow me. Follow me. These two individuals, our officers in our organizations and all the rest of them, they are your leaders. They are where you want to be in three and four years. You follow them, but time goes really fast. And in a blink of an eye, you are going to be here talking to freshmen about the things they need to do. You're going to be out front. If your leadership on your application is empty, you will not get an interview. Those are your five full-time jobs that are going to lead to that success in medical school. Is it going to be easy? Nope. You're going to be doing an awful lot of this. Is it going to be fun? Not all the time. So how do you accomplish everything set before you? You want to be a doctor, but how do you overcome being tired? How do you overcome wanting to do all these other things? Well, I have a message for you. From one of our great philosophers, you know, we've had Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. Here's a message from one of our great modern day philosophers. But sneaking out like this, quitting, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Baseball is what gets inside you. It's what lights you up. You can't deny that. It just got too hard. It's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. That's from the movie A League of Their Own. His catcher was quitting. Because why, why was she quitting? It got too hard. And the last thing he said, it's the hard that makes it great. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But the path you are embarking on is the most challenging curriculum on this campus. I don't apologize for it. I own it. I love it. But it's not easy. It's going to take something called discipline. 
Discipline is not something that is popular these days because it's all about immediate gratification. But let me tell you, the price of discipline is always going to be much less than the pain of regret. So, how do we find and exercise this discipline? Here's another great man that had a message. You might recognize him. Discipline is choosing between what you want right now versus what you want the most. If everyone in this world, if everyone in our country, when they were faced with a decision, if they could ask themselves that question, can you imagine how this world could be transformed for the better? The news would have nothing to talk about but great things. We would have neighbors all over the world. And you will be successful. But it doesn't come instantly and it doesn't come immediately. Your self-discipline, you are banking on your future success. Savings accounts aren't very popular anymore because you basically pay the bank to hold your money. But you have to invest those times where there's this party you really want to go to. I can't. I've got to study for that OCHEM test the next day. Hey, we're having a road trip this weekend. Man, you know, I'm a leader of our organization that's doing a Habitat for Humanity project. We're finishing house for a low-income family. I have to be there. Does that mean you will never have fun in college? Absolutely not. But you've got to put your priorities first. And in many instances, if you want to be a doctor, you have to exercise that self-discipline. Now, if you don't, if you get to campus and you do what I call students doing, get here and lose their mind, and they don't go to class, they stay on their phones playing Pokemon Go all day long, you're not going to make it. This is where you're going to be if you do that. <laughs> A mind-numbing eight-to-five job for the rest of your life because you chose the now versus the most. But if you exercise that discipline, you are going to walk across that stage in four years, graduating summa cum laude, highest honors. You've got a letter of acceptance in your back pocket to Dallas Southwestern Medical School. And when they put that diploma in your hand and you're standing on that stage in front of the crowd, knowing you've accomplished what few accomplish, you know what you're going to do. You're not going to hang your head. You're not going to wonder what your future holds. Now, I tried this last week. I don't know. We, we learned this in my high school camp. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best here, okay? You're going to get that diploma. You're going to stand on that stage. And you're going <laughs> to... <laughs> Did I do that right? Is that, is that okay? Yeah. That's what you're going to do. And then you're going to put that on. So when you're faced with a decision, the picture I want you to put in your head is not that white coat. It's these rocking chairs. Students, talk to your parents. We wish somebody would invent a time machine so we could go back and undo the stupid stuff we did. When we tell you things, it's not that we're smart. It's just we've screwed it up before and we don't want you to screw up. That's wisdom experience but we can't students you have a time machine and your time machine when you're faced with a decision is this what I want now or is this what I want the most you have a conversation with your 80 year old self sitting in that rocking chair in your retirement home and is that 80 year old self gonna say no don't do that if you do that, you're going to fail that class. You'll never get into medical school. You'll have a job that you hate the rest of your life, and you'll be sitting on this porch regretting it to your grave. Or your 80-year-old self sitting on the porch of your retirement home in Boca Raton, Florida, sipping on the drink with a little umbrella <laughs> is going to tell you, no, you know what you need to do, and you're going to do it. 
and you're going to make it to medical school. You're going to save thousands of lives in your career. You're going to provide for your family. Your grandchildren are going to be provided for. You are going to have a good life. Think about those chairs and make the good choices and the good decisions with the self-discipline you're going to learn. Now, the last assignment I have for you, you go home and before you come back to your dorm, you cut out pictures of three people, random people. You tape these to the mirror of your bathroom in your dorm and every morning when you wake up, you look at those three people that want your seat in medical school and you look at them and you say, I'm gonna kick your butt today. No way you're gonna outwork me today. And you do that and at night, when you look at them again before you go to bed, you look them in the face and you said, I got you today. And you sleep well in that assurance of how hard you worked. You know why? Because you got to do it again tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. And the next day. Why? Because those three other people are doing it. If that's what you want the most, you've got five full-time jobs and you have to do them all well. And here in the Pre-Health Professions Program, that's what we're to help you accomplish and to help you succeed so you don't have regrets. Thank you for your attention. Hopefully you have a great day today.